Okay, well, good evening, everybody. My name is John Pottle. I'm the director of the Royal Institute of Navigation. I'm sure many of you know the RIN, as we call ourselves. Um, and our objectives are to advance knowledge and understanding of all things uh, related to navigation. This particular webinar is uh, arranged and put on by our General Aviation Navigation Group. So this webinar is about air procs, uh, mid-air mid -air collisions and I, I think we're going to hear how general aviation aircraft feature quite heavily in, uh, in, in air proximity situations. Uh, hopefully, we're also going to hear about some of the complexities, some of the things to be aware of in relation to um, use of aids and looking out of the window and so on. So our, our two speakers this evening uh, are in the order that they're going to talk, uh, David Coburn, who was uh, for 15 years the UK Civil Aviation, General Aviation Safety Promotion Officer. Um, David's also an active member of the General Aviation Group in the RIN. Um, and then to be followed by Ian Fraser, who is a scientist by background and very familiar with the various systems, uh, satellite systems and so on as well, uh, that help us figure out where we are, where we're going and where other objects are. Um, Ian is also a light aircraft pilot and user and a good critical thinker. So, you know, just what we need in this situation. Um, I don't want to get all legalistic, but I think I do need to state that the webinar is really not intended as a tutorial or a how-to guide. It's, it's merely to stimulate discussion and provide some perspectives and allow a discussion, which is really what we're all about in the RIN. So with that introduction, it's my pleasure to hand over the floor to, or the virtual floor to David Copen. David, please. Hi, good evening, everybody. As a light aircraft pilot and flying instructor, I take a little bit of an interest in the safety of, my, of the air around me. But for tonight, I'm going to talk almost exclusively about air proxies. The United Kingdom Air Proxy Board receives reports of, of events where pilots consider that this event almost resulted in a collision. The Air Proxy Board considers all these reports uh, in depth and it publishes annual reports as well as individual reports on their discussions. Um, as it happened, I got hold of the 2020 annual report last November. Um, and realized that not only was it interest, generally interesting reading all the way through uh, and includes links to individual reports, which the board considered uh, worth looking at. Um, it got me thinking. So I produced a, a, an article in the Light Aircraft Association magazine um, at the end of the year. And uh, the GA navigation group thought it might be a good idea um, to make it more widely available throughout the Institute and friends. So I thought I'd, I'd come up with a bit of a presentation on it right now, but actually in the meantime, uh, the director of the Airprox board very kindly managed to get me some of the statistics that they've been looking at for 2021. Now they haven't actually finished an analyzing all of these, but um, so my backup, if those of you who read the, uh, the article may find that some of the figures are slightly different because I can refer to much more up-to-date ones. Bit of a background, as I say, um, those of you who do not know what the Airprox board does or what Airprox really are, um, I'm just going to throw a couple of slides on the board here without um, going through them in the uh, time-honored PowerPoint, PowerPoint fashion. Um, the annual reports for 2020, 2000, and the stats 2021 are, are generally very similar. Uh, okay, there are differences in 10% you know, here, 10% there, but the, the general figures are fairly close. Um, in fact, the reported numbers of air proxies, um, the reported almost collisions, um, and the associated uh, proportion of what was assessed as high risk ones um, has been remarkably similar over the last 10 years. So 
just to put a bit of background in, the board divides its statistics um, into specific sectors of aviation. Um, you'll notice we've put general aviation at the top there, including sports and recreational and, and training flights as well. Um, but from these in the uh, from the information on these sectors, and I uh, I apologise for the finger trouble on my spelling. Um, <laughs> when I looked at the annual reports, the SUAS, the uncrewed air, air vehicles, um, featured quite highly in the air proxies that were received by the board. Um, but what was mainly concerning was that general aviation tended to be more, well, tend, tended to have air proxies with each other um, much more commonly than anything else. In fact, um, as the slide says, in the 10 years, 80% um, of aircraft to aircraft events, that's not including the SUAS drones, as I might call them, probably incorrectly. 80% uh, of the aircraft to aircraft events involve general aviation light aircraft. Um, notice that the air props board have got this lovely habit of saying this includes unknown and untraced aircraft because they all look the same. And in 2021, the figure itself was, um, to, was 92%. And that happens to be one of the charts taken out of the annual report. And the big sector is general aviation versus general aviation. And most of the rest of them are general aviation, um, having an air prox with somebody else. And for those not aware, the air prox board divide the severity of these incidents into categories. Uh, categories A and B we regard, or they regard, as risk-bearing air proxies. Category C, where a large number of the reports come in, or basically somebody saw the other aircraft um, you know, very late on and twitched, but actually there was no risk of a collision. It just looked a bit dodgy. Um, category E is where there was, there was actually nothing to look, nothing to worry about at all. As I say, categories A and B are considered to be risk-bearing air proxies. And of these risk-bearing air proxies, this is what really attracted my attention because um, the annual report of 2020 said 90% of all risk-bearing aircraft to aircraft events involved a general aviation, sports and recreational light aircraft. 90% of all that they'd received. In 2021, with the more up-to-date figures, <laughs> There were only 3% that didn't involve a GA sports and recreational light aircraft. Um, and just to let you, you know, make you aware, um, there weren't 59 of these um, in the year. So I talked about percentages, the airport board talking percentages. I thought I'd throw the fact that it was actually a number there. And what's worse, in, tw uh, in 2020, they reported that all the category A aircraft to aircraft, that's the ones which basically there but for the grace of God was a collision. They all involved general aviation, sports and recreational aircraft. Looking at the figures for 2021, it seems nothing changed. Again, all the category aircraft to aircraft air proxies involved the GA aircraft, a GA sports and recreational, because general aviation does also include business jets and things like that. But basically, what, we, what we're looking at is general aviation pilots just aren't seeing each other. As a quick sort of slightly a thought, um, it does say that most of the um, air proxies occurred in class G airspace, which is uncontrolled airspace. Nothing unusual about that because most general aviation recreational aircraft fly around in class G uncontrolled airspace. So the question came around, well, how do we actually avoid hitting each other or having air proxies, which is the one. And the airport board highlighted that situational awareness 
is a major key to avoiding the air proxies. In fact, they said if anybody had, if people had decent situational awareness, there weren't any air proxies, which seems fairly logical because if you know that there's something liable to hit you, you're going to get out of its way before it does. So if you know where the threat is liable to come from, that's the other aircraft, it helps. If we can listen to what other people are saying over the radio, if we can make sensible radio calls ourselves, um, if we could, <laughs> I have to laugh because the airport would say, if we ask for a traffic service from an air traffic control unit, um, that would help. Well, that's great, but most air traffic control units are far too busy to give us a traffic service around the UK. So I, um, yes, if you can get one, it's great. If air traffic control can tell you, can warn you, because if you ask for a traffic service, they will, get, will warn you of other aircraft coming that might become a threat to you. Um, that's fantastic. But if it doesn't work, or if you can't get it, it's not an awful lot of good. Um, and the air procs board did actually note that in 60% of the risk bearing air procs, either air traffic control wasn't used or they provided a service which did not give traffic information. In other words, they gave a basic service. Um, yeah, I'm afraid I can't be that optimistic about the ability of air traffic control to give us traffic service if we all start asking for it. It's quite fun when one or two of us ask for it, we can get it. When 10 of us ask, it's, the controller is gonna be far too busy. However, situational awareness, we can help ourselves quite well. We can try and pre-think where the threats are liable to be. If we're flying across the country through our chart, there are going to be places where other air, we're going to find choke points, perhaps other aircraft coming the other way. In this case, Doncaster's controlled airspace on one side and the Red Arrows display area on the other side. Anybody going north or south through there is going through a very narrow gap. Um, at certain heights, it's now a transponder mandatory zone, but basically it's a very busy area. You really got to keep your eyes open, especially around there. And if you're taking your passenger, passengers to um, go sightseeing, perhaps up to the Dermot Dam, that's an interesting place. Um, you know, was that where the dam busters did their bombing? Yes, well, it's nice to look at. Uh, unfortunately, if you think it's a good thing to look at, there's probably going to be an awful lot of other people who think it's a good thing to look at. So watch out, that's where the traffic is going to be. And if we as pilots start enjoying the uh, you know, looking down at the ground, like our passengers, we stand a pretty good risk of getting far too close to another aircraft, if not actually hitting it. And one of the um, air prox comments was that a lot of air proxies occurred with gliders. Now, as a glider pilot myself, do you know there are usually airborne on a particular on a particular summer's day. There are probably more gliders airborne than there are aeroplanes, um, certainly what I would call the spam cans. Um, watch out, gliders use rising air to get from A to B, and in the summer especially, for example, these cumulus clouds that we see up here um, are good indications of rising air, so it's probably not a good idea for us with aeroplanes to be flying underneath these cumulus clouds, especially not close to the cloud base. Um, and if they happen to be running in streets, you know, one cloud followed by another, um, it, that's a good area to get out of the way from. So if you can fly above it, that's great. Not just try and stay to one side of the cumulus. Another little problem we can have, especially in the summer, is I, I, sorry, high pressure, anti-cyclonic gloom. If visibility is not very good, we're not going to be able to see an aircraft coming the other way. So if we can do something about keeping out of the way of the haze, let's talk about flying above it, maybe? You might not be able to see navigation features any better than you could when you're in the haze, but you can see other aircraft coming towards you. 
a lot further away than you could in the haze. And it's not just murk that can uh, affect you know, seeing other aircraft. Now, in the summer, hopefully, the sun, you're normally flying with the sun quite high. Um, if the sun is low in the sky, as it tends to be closer to the winter, um, and the canopy is not particularly clean, or it's got glick uh, crazing, or whatever, um, that sun will prevent you seeing in that direction. Um, the old adage of the fighter pilot, um, beware the enemy in the sun. Um, difficult to see. But so I, you know, I try and make sure that when I'm looking for navigation features or my destination airfield or where there are liable to be a load of other aircraft, I try and keep that hazard or navigation feature down sun of me. As normally I keep the navigation feature downwind of me because I'm a lazy so-and-so, I would try and keep them down sun as well, whatever. That, yeah. And of course, there's always, to help us with situational awareness, the ability to buy an electronic, electronic conspicuity device. And I'm going to leave talking about that um, over to Ian. Uh, although I have to say, I do use one myself. I fly my gliders um, and I find it jolly useful in giving me situate, uh, awareness of the situation of where other aircraft are when I'm descending with the tug. But situational awareness, okay, if we've got perfect situational awareness, we should be able to avoid other aircraft, but it won't always work. We've actually got to see what our threat is. I've mentioned the dirty canopy already. Um, you'll notice I wear glasses. Well, yes, I do. Um, I wear sunglasses actually when I'm flying, but they've got the little reading cut out at the bottom. If you're not able to see things, or if you're struggling to read maps or that sort of thing, it means you're not spending much time looking at, so your lookout tends to fail. So try and keep make, you know, we have to make sure that our pilots are properly um, able to see little thought that looking out actually demands quite a lot of concentration. Um, I'm aware of how much concentration it calls, it, it calls, and that's one of the reasons I try and work out um, my choke points and things to just, that's the point I'm going to have to concentrate hardest on looking out and never forget the passenger. The passenger can be jolly helpful. I don't know if anybody can say anything for, uh, to me, but can you all see the glider that's coming towards you? And so I said, since I can't hear anybody saying anything, I'm just going to have to highlight it myself. Okay, gliders are very difficult to spot, especially head on, but any aircraft is difficult to spot head on. Now I've gone way, way, way in front of myself. Right. Right, sorry. I'll just quickly talk slightly about what flying instructors ought to be teaching their pilots to do, and that is to move their eyes around the threat area, around the, the sky in front of them, basically, and above and below the horizon. But in order to see things properly, and because the threat that's going to hit you is the one that doesn't move in your field of view, you have to move your eyes in about 10 degree segments um, through a series of saccades and you've got to allow time to focus on each of these segments. Um, a youngster can probably do it every second. Old men like me take a couple of seconds for each focusing to do. You can either start on one side and work your way right round or the way I tend to recommend, which is start from the middle, go out one way, come back to the middle, check whatever you need to check inside the cockpit, back outside and check the other side. And that gets highly recommended by the European GA safety team, which I used to be a member of. Um, again, can we see the aircraft? I don't know whether you can. It might be, you can see that one there. However, if it's not right in the middle of our field of vision, you might miss the one, the one that's over there. 
at least I think there's one over there. I can't see it on my screen, but uh, hopefully it's over there. Okay. Military aircraft always fly around in pairs or always expect them to fly around in pairs. That's a big hazard. However, that brings me to the fact that, okay, if we're looking for another aircraft and we're having to concentrate and we're having to scan, scan's going to take time. How long have we got? How long have we got before something hits us? If it appears in our field of view? Well, um, about 20, 25 years ago, the British Gliding Association carried out a series of trials with a, motor, with a couple of motor gliders just to see how easy it was to see an aircraft that was coming, you know, that was going to hit you. And from a variety of directions, the average acquisition distance was two and a half miles. Some of them you didn't see until they were less than half a mile away, in which case the system, the safety system burnt in and everybody broke away. But two and a half miles. Anything that was coming from head on, the average distance was two miles on a good, clear, clear day. That was the amount of distance that on average you could see an aircraft coming towards you. So two, two miles head on, two and a half. Just a thought, there, there was a, you know, people wouldn't normally go visual flying with the visibility less than 3000 meters. So that's a, one and a half miles. Um, if you're flying in that poor visibility at 180 knots closing speed, that's 90 each way, gives you 30 seconds to do something about it. Um, if you've got, if you're traveling at 120 knots and you've got two miles to sit to, to react, uh, then you, it's 30 seconds you've got as time from picking it up, doing something about it to get out of the way. So if you've got your eye inside the cockpit, how long do we keep our eye inside the cockpit to check things? Looking at maps, charts, always we keep saying, telling people lift your chart up to the field of view, but you do need to look at things, instruments, charts, frequency cards, whatever it might be. You can't afford to be looking inside for more than about 10 seconds at a time. It's going to take time to scan around the horizon as well. That's going to take another 10, maybe 20 seconds anyway. So you can't afford to be not looking out at all because it takes time to actually, for the aircraft to move. Once you see something, realize it's a threat, move the controls, it takes time for the aircraft to move. And I'd just like to finish with a very quick look at um, the risk altitudes. Uh, 2021, 89% of the events took place below 3,000 feet. You know, 50% below 1,500 feet, which leads me to think, there's the, the, the slide the uh, prop board produced, isn't it? Leads me to think that basically it's in the circuit that the biggest hazard is. And, you know, um, I've taken some figures and worked out, okay, it has to be, and they reckon, reckon that um, uh, yeah, they could report, they didn't know exactly where they were, but in air traffic zones, aerodrome traffic zones rather than MATSIs, they could say it's this number, um, and that tended to click, uh, to click with the Netherlands Air Transport Safety Institute's findings that 60% of the US mid-air collisions occurred in the traffic pattern. So there are a couple of things about the traffic pattern I'd just like to highlight before I go. The first one is fly the pattern that is recommended, make appropriate calls so that people can hear you and develop their situational awareness. Make them in the right place so that people can see them. You can see them and you can build up where they are. But Another one which I tend to now recommend to all my students is before you make any turns in the circuit, look outside the circuit pattern as well as inside, because it's amazing how many people do not conform to the standard pattern and try and push their way in from outside. And you do not want to be hit by one of them when they're in your blind spot. 
And the final thing if I say about circuits is we try and teach people to fly accurate heights. If you're flying at an accurate height, the and everybody else is flying at the same height, you can see them better. If you're looking down at them, they're very difficult to spot. Anyway, I think I've yabbered on long enough, so if I'd like to hand over to Ian now, with apologies, I've overrun a bit, and over to you, sir. Right, um, my section is uh, intended really to complement an awful lot of what David has said. Um, um, I'm going to talk about electronic conspicuity and how it can aid the uh, effectively the eyeballs and the uh, cockpit. The first thing I have to say is to augment again what uh, David was saying about the visual scan. This is a picture of uh, me and my RV6 approaching somewhere. Um, I have Hensbridge, I think. Um, what you can actually see in terms of the total sphere of possible angles of approach to an aircraft is around about 25%. Some of the better aircraft, probably about 30%. So there's a vast amount of directions from the aircraft that you can't see. Um, for instance, in this aircraft, you can see, you're, even, even if you're scanning, you're gonna be able to see no more than uh, plus or minus 180 degrees, maybe uh, 200 degrees, and then you run into a bit, a bit of um, bulkhead on the aircraft. Downwards on an RV6 is very, very poor. I mean, we're flying relatively slow with flaps, so the nose is quite down. In the normal attitude, you see very little ahead of you. Upwards, well, this has got a sun uh, visor despite the rain on the uh, windscreen, and uh, that limits the uh, visibility. So in this case, I think I probably can see around about 25% if I'm scanning, and that's moving my head probably uh, around plus or minus 30 degrees as well. If we have a look at what's happening in uh, general aviation, and particularly in choke points nowadays, the dynamic range of the speeds of the aircraft is now vastly different to what it was when the CAA originally developed the uh, sort of avoidance maneuvers and said, if you see something, avoid to the right. Right now, we are in a situation where an aircraft like this cruises at around about 145 knots. Other aircraft at the same airfield have a cruise of closer to 60. Knots. Meanwhile, the airfields, the, particularly the uh, sort of uh, the commercial airfields, are trying to collect more and more and more airspace, and resulting in us getting narrow and narrow corridors left for us. So we get a situation which air traffic control have known about for a long time, and even they don't have particularly good methods of managing, and that's called catch up. And that's one of the things that I thought is worth raising because much more now so than used to be the case, an aircraft can be closing from the rear at 120 knots. So all of a sudden, that sphere of interest is well, well outside of the visual uh, capability of the, the pilot to scan. And this is a good introduction really for um, electronic conspicuity. Electronic conspicuity is based on a technology called Autonomous Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. And everybody says, oh yes, that's a certified system. No, it's not, it's a technology. And everything from a car tracker through to the uh, Mode S transponders and the um, uh, uh, various transponders that you find in military aircraft are all an ADSB type of system. What it's doing is that the, each of the aircraft, and this is a picture I um, grabbed from uh, Flight Radar 24, each one of these aircraft is transmitting independently of any radar scanning or anything else like that. It's height, it's position, it's heading, it's speed, it's type, and quite a lot of other data. If it's a commercial aircraft, yes, of, um, it's, it's load, it's passengers, and all sorts of other bits of information in that message. And all other aircraft are able to pick that up. And so they can also generate this picture. And that's what electronic conspicuity is trying to achieve. Oops. Right, CAA um, have been publicizing um, electronic conspicuity together with their 250 quid uh, grants towards it 
under the slogan see and be seen and it's quite important to understand what the actual differences are in terms of equipment. And I'll start off with the be seen. This is a beacon. This is the beacon that does the transmitting of that uh, ADSB type of message. And uh, again, I've looked at a diagram of my own aircraft so that I uh, keep, keep out of any sort of um, product um, related uh, issues. It comprises two, two parts. It has a GPS system which relies on the global navigation satellites, at least three of them, and it will determine your position to a reasonable accuracy and a device EC out, which transmits that position. Um, the ETA, I mean, in, in UK, and this is the only time I'm going to mention this, there are three disparate standards. There's Pilot Aware, FLAM, and the one that's associated with the normal air traffic control transponder, 1090 extended squitter. And that's as far as I'm going to go on um, the beacons. Those are what we're looking for. And as long as you are transmitting, then somebody else stands a chance of seeing you electronically. If you're not transmitting, then nobody will see you at all, regardless of what equipment they have. The other side of it, and this is what this um, presentation is really about, is looking at the, the how you see the traffic in the aircraft. And again, for Electronic cost security in device, which sometimes is merged with the out device, um, sometimes it's an independent system. It also requires a GPS to determine the position of your own aircraft. So it can compare that position of your own aircraft with the um, positions that are transmitted from the other aircraft. And that gives it an opportunity to be able to calculate the difference between the positions in heights and so on like that. And that's the electronic cost security inside of the processor. And they're just a little bit of uh, te technological um, uh, sort of um, magic that I shall again pass uh, over and come on to the traffic display because having determined where that other, uh, that other traffic is, the key is to alert the pilot to it. And I've got uh, several slides now that I've looked at the various systems that are available to do that. And I'll start with the um, clock, what I've called clock displays. So that's actually what the more generic versions of them called. There was a version of this in David's aircraft. Um, there's a version of this in one of the aircraft. I've got some photographs later. What this is telling you is, let me just, uh, oh, I've lost my cursor. What this is telling you is that there's an aircraft ahead. It's, um, I've lost part of it, uh, part of my picture, sorry. Um, the, the, the green light is identified that the aircraft is ahead and um, there is on the, on the right of the picture, which I've got covered with uh, something else, um, is a range for that aircraft. And down the side is a, um, a azimuth from it. So if there's no display there, then it is theoretically at the same level as you are. If the, the first light is lit, it's um, up to seven degrees higher than you are. And the second light up to 14 degrees angle above you and similarly going down. Normally, this type of display doesn't react particularly. It shows you there's traffic in a proximity, but if it determines if you're um, ADSB, so if your um, EC in device determines there is a threat, it will change the, the color of the lead to red. And in this particular case, the distance is closed to uh, 0.2 nautical miles. It's coming from behind and it's perceived by the system to be a threat. These systems are very, very good at giving you a very quick picture of what's happening, but they don't help, to my mind, they don't help as much as some of the other displays in determining the, the real situation awareness. What is the aircraft behind you actually doing? Is it crossing? Is it approaching me quickly? You don't really know. The next display that you find, and this is very, very common, it's, um, it is often where the, um, uh, electronic constituity in devices linked to one of the um, electronic um, maps that uh, we carry around. This, this particular um, example is Sky Demon. 
Um, they're all very well. They do give you a very good situational in, um, uh, awareness because they give you a complete picture of everything you can detect. But just like uh, David couldn't really see the glider in the mountains or the uh, two aircraft in the haze, there's so much clutter on a map that it's very difficult to actually see where the aircraft is. So in this particular case, it is above, this is at um, uh, Staverton and it's a, a little bit above the aircraft uh, to north to Staverton. And it's actually in the circuit at Staverton. The, my aircraft in this particular case was parked in a lay by an A40 to the south of the airfield. And you can see that as a yellow aircraft there. But it's, if you imagine you're busy in the cockpit, you're scanning, you're dealing with a chattering passenger, you're looking out for, if you're looking at your instruments, everything else like that. A quick glance at this map wouldn't spot that aircraft. Now I'll just show how this um, picture evolves. And you see the aircraft has now turned to approach the Sully runway at uh, Staverton and the lines change green. But you really can't see that that well. And then if I index is a little bit further on, it's now changed to yellow. And again, that's just the skies of the local road. Very, very difficult to identify. And then I just blew it up to show you what uh, happens there. As it gets close enough, uh, to within half a mile, then it will turn red and identify it. But in itself, while providing good spatial awareness, that display is not that easy as a primary alert mechanism. And so it's, in a way, I think the better toy for the passenger. So if you've got a passenger who's interested, that's great to give them. They can see what's going on and they can tell you about the uh, traffic. But flying solo with one of these, dependent on it for uh, traffic awareness, not very easy at all. Too cluttered to display. So the next system that we have is the so-called radar or plan position indicator display. And this is very similar now to that sort of display that is used in a commercial aircraft. Sometimes commercial aircraft will in, um, superimpose this on its map um, as well, so it gives you a bit more of a cluttered display, but most of them have an option to keep it nice and clear. And this one shows the, um, this time we're, we're flying, it shows uh, a, a, an aircraft, uh, X-ray uh, Romeo Victor Bravo, about a mile and a bit ahead, and about 100 feet above, the plus one that's 100 feet above. Very, very easy uh, to identify where it is. And the little green dotted line I'll come on to later because that also tells us a bit of information about uh, what it was doing. Another picture um, of, of that. So this is, this is uh, the aircraft on the ground now. And, uh, it shows the aircraft in the circuit, and you can immediately see where that aircraft, where, where that information is. On the clock display earlier, the uh, PUP 163 would have looked like a threat. It would have been a green light ahead, and um, you wouldn't really have known what it's doing. But in fact, it's going across there, and it's it's on a uh, crosswind join, and the um, the other aircraft, uh, Victor Bravo, is um, late downwind. So it gives you a very good and clear picture of what the traffic is doing. And if, just like the other ones, if the traffic gets closer, it will highlight. And uh, in this case, it's, uh, it's uh, made it yellow, put a bright spot on the, uh, on the, uh, on the marker. And I find that this is very much easier display to assimilate, but, it also has an awful lot of complexes. But if I just move on to talk about audio warnings, all the devices that I've talked about so far, FLAM, Pilot Aware, um, or all the sort of fully certified systems, all have an audio warning capability. Sometimes it's a beep, sometimes it's uh, sort of traffic, traffic, or it could even be sort of bandits uh, two o'clock, as in Top Gun but they all have it, but almost nobody ever connects them up. And I do not know why, because having flown around with these systems for about four years, most of the time, most of the threats that have been alerted to me by the electronic transport system have come via an initial traffic warning audio. And the cycle, my cycle of it, things are a traffic warning, a quick look at the display, 
work out whether I could see it or not, and then do something about it. We'll come on to that a little bit later, but I do not understand why people do not connect the audio warning systems of their electronic car security systems, because this is, to me, by far the strongest way of alerting yourself to traffic, and it's the one that's least disruptive to everything else that you're doing. Right, I'm gonna go back to the uh, display. These display tell you an awful lot more, perhaps, and like everything else technological, there are simple ways of using them and there are complicated ways of using them. And this one has got some green dotted lines. And on the map display, you saw that there was a, a sort of colored dotted lines, but they were showing the heading of the aircraft. In this particular case, the dotted lines are showing the relative motion. And it's extending this particular case, it's, the dotted line is 30 seconds of your time long. And it shows at the end of the, dot, the, uh, the green dotted line where the aircraft will be relative to you if everybody keeps on doing the same thing. So you can see the um, aircraft, the, 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 the top aircraft, um, Brother Whiskey, is actually square. That means it's actually stationary on the ground. So that's another bit of information that's come out of, uh, of this display. Um, 23, um, 100 feet below. Um, and so I, if I'm flying along there and uh, in 30 seconds, um, it will be more or less in my two o'clock. The aircraft to the bottom left, uh, November Yankee, is flying across um, the, the stern, of the, the rear of the aircraft. And again, because so I'm going forward and it's going across, it shows it will actually be further away from me in the 30 seconds and so on. And this sort of display it's just one example of some of the cleverer things that um, the, these displays will do. But do we all understand them? And this is an area where I've been campaigning for some time. No training syllabuses cover electronic car security at all. The handbooks that the manufacturers supply really leave a lot wanting. This, for instance, came from working it out. It's a Garmin product that I'm showing you here now. I had to work out what they meant because it wasn't in the handbook for the uh, device. Legislation and guidance doesn't cover it. And Skyway code doesn't address what you do. And I'm just going to come on to that in a minute. So what do we do when we get an alert? Again, if you pick up the, um, the handbooks um, associated with electronic car security devices, they all have one written by the commercial lawyer saying that they're not responsible for the information it gives you. They are simply an aid to guide you to look at the scan. So what do you do? The Skyway code says if you find conflicting traffic, search, find and turn right. Well, that's absolutely fine if you find it. But you have to be aware that there is a limitation on these things, that it's not a guaranteed picture. Not, aircraft, not all aircraft will be visible, and you will not see all the aircraft that trigger an alert either, because some of them will be behind you. The other thing you need to understand about these synthetic displays is accuracy. Now that picture says that um, Victor Bravo is the same height as um, the, the uh, primary aircraft around about a mile ahead. Is it? The, some of you who have been aware of um, electronic car security may, and some of the uh, sort of websites may have heard the discussion about system integrity levels of naught and one and two, and the argument is for whether you should ever use a um, system integrity level naught device. That's telling you something about how accurate the information is. And particularly, one thing that gets missed is that a system integrity level naught is using a GPS altitude or could be using a GPS altitude, whereas the large majority of these systems, things are comparing it with a pressure altitude. And you can find in an extreme low pressure, high pressure situation, up to a thousand foot error. And yet there's no way in any of the displays of any of the systems I've come across at this moment in time of telling you what that error may be. But even with calibrated systems, um, normally, um, for, certainly for light, for, um, light aircraft associated permit aircraft, the method of calibrating your um, 
uh, altimeter is first of all is to uh, check it on the ground and make sure it's right and then you check your transponder output your mode c by going and flying to your altimeter calling up the um, local uh, traffic control people and asking them what heights they got for you and it is acceptable to be within plus or minus 200 feet Position error is another problem with GPS positions normally are very, very good. And um, I don't doubt that most of what we're using is, is nearly always very good. But if it's being jammed, if you're in a valley, for instance, where you're obscuring the sky from the satellites, before your GPS quits, it could be plus or minus 500 feet. Now the GPSs themselves are passing this information onwards. And so your ADS-BN device knows this, but it doesn't do anything with it. So there's no indication at all on the device as to how good that information that you're looking at is. So while the pictures, as I demonstrate here, look absolute, there is a tolerance to be considered. Now it's all very well looking at that and saying, okay, but um, that's fairly easy. It's a mile behind what's uh, 500 feet. It's not that much. Um, so relative to this particular picture, um, yes, it tells you where it is, and the message really from that is to take a decision. If you find a conflicting aircraft, take a decision as to what to do about it early, because the later you leave it, the less accurate that relative position is. Here um, is a picture. If you have a look on the, uh, uh, the, the, the aircraft, um, panel down, down, down on the bottom left there, you'll see a uh, clock display. And the clock display shows that there is indeed conflicting aircraft. It's a warning. It says it's very, very close. It's in the five o'clock and it is at least 14 degrees downwards from the aircraft. Yet, look at it. That's the aircraft that's flying the trigger. It's at about two o'clock and it's high. That's what goes wrong with um, depending on the accuracy of these systems. Now that was a bit of a staged um, uh, exercise, but it did surprise us just how inaccurate the, um, the uh, that, that was a flam display and how inaccurate that was. So were there ever any uh, shrinking airspace and large difference in our relative air, uh, aircraft performance? catch up as an increasing risk. Now, if you have a look at all the air traffic control documentation on uh, how to manage this, it has all sorts of things it talks about doing, but at the end of the day, it says it's the pilot's decision as to what to do. The line of stern is probably the hardest one to deal with, and that's becoming more and more com uh, commonplace. Uh, I mean, David picked uh, the gap between Doncaster and Waddington as an example, which I fly quite often. Um, there's the Manchester low level, there's the one underneath the Southampton airspace, all of them narrow waypoints, choke points, if you like. You're going to be catching up, certainly in an RB6 uh, following a microlight, you're going to be catching up because you're flying at his speed, you're too close to stall. So you're going to be catching up, but will you see him? Has he got a beacon? Even if he has got it, um, because he might not have a beacon, but he might have a pilot aware receiver, so he might see you. So what does he do? So here's a, a picture of a, of a closing uh, aircraft. It's, it's obviously uh, closing up uh, fairly closely. Skyway code says turn right, but when and where? And if indeed he's following the Skyway code as well, he's going to turn right to avoid you, and you're going to turn straight into his avoidance maneuver. So I would challenge the floor to tell me, what would you do in this situation? And the message really from this is, this is not a decision to take in the 30 seconds you've got from that situation. What you've got to do is to have it worked out for yourself, a plan. What do I do if somebody's coming up like that behind? When do I react to it? Do I turn left, which is what I would do? Have a plan to resolve conflicts that you can't see. 
one of the easiest things you can do is when you look at that display, you can say, when you first look at it, could I ever see it? If it's in the aft semicircle, the answer is no. So don't even bother wasting time to look, do something about it, turn left, move out of his obvious track. Something like this display has a good lot of spatial awareness information. You can tell what other aircraft are doing. The clock display is not nearly as easy to use. And as I said, the map displays are quite cluttered. So they're actually quite difficult to determine exactly what's happening, but have a plan. So to summarize, electronic cost security is experiencing increasing take up. Do we all understand exactly what it's telling us? Yes, it's saying there's an aircraft behind, but how accurate? Is it exactly the same height as it's reporting us? Is it indeed, even if it's um, saying that it, it could be as much as 200 feet, or it could be as much as 1,000 feet uh, in error? Do you have a plan to avoid the detected aircraft you can't see? Be prepared, have a, pl have a plan. And just to summarize, these uh, two presentations were based on articles in um, Light Aviation um, magazine, and uh, they, um, uh, they can be found, reprints can be found on the uh, Light Aircraft Association. I believe Claire is going to uh, put, a link, put this link in the um, notes and uh, on the website afterwards. Thank you very much. <laughs>